open your Bibles this morning, if you would please, to the book of Titus. Uh, the book of Titus. Uh, now, I, I do have a confession to make. This is, uh, uh, the book of Titus has a, uh, this is more of a, uh, what, what is sometimes referred to among preachers as a textual type of a message rather than an expository. But there's a great truth that is presented here in the book of Titus in these first few verses. And that's really the, the pivot point that we want to use uh, for not only this Sunday, but next Sunday. Uh, this Sunday, uh, I'm going to be uh, dealing with, uh, talking about empty promises. I'm going to be talking about the empty promises that man has made to God. And by the way, like it or not, we make a lot of empty promises. Now next Sunday, I'm going to mess your mind up when I tell you this. I'm going to go ahead and tell you which direction I'm going next Sunday. Next Sunday is going to be the empty promises that God has made to us. Now before you jump to conclusions, the word empty can be uh, defined a little bit differently, okay? But there's some empty things that God has promised. And God always keeps His promises, by the way. So, uh, so that's what we'll be dealing with next week. But, uh, but I want you to see this and just, uh, I'm not even exactly sure how I ran across this idea, but I was reading something somewhere and someone, uh, some writer made a comment about uh, our empty promises to God. And it was one of those things that the Lord just sort of used it as an inspiration point. And, uh, it has been growing ever since. So uh, I, I, I really believe this is what God uh, has for us today. But uh, Titus chapter two, uh, chapter one, excuse me, verses one through three. Let's stand together as we read these uh, three verses together, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. The Bible says this: Titus chapter one, verse one. It says, "Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life." which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Notice again verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your blessed word. And I pray, dear God, now today that you would just take your word and use it in a very mighty way to speak to each and every one of our hearts and lives. And Lord, you know the need in every heart. You know our needs even better than we know our needs. I pray the Holy Spirit would work in each heart and life. And I pray that each of us would be responsive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray that... Lord, that which is right and proper in your sight would be our decision and our desire today. And if there's anyone here that does not know you as Savior, Lord, just show each one their need of Christ. And we'll thank you for it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. You know, uh, today, uh, many churches across America will be celebrating uh, uh, and, and having a special service that they will refer to as Palm Sunday. Now, I, I, I don't want you to misunderstand. I don't have any axe to grind. I don't have a dog in that fight, okay, if, if you please. I've just never been prone to get into some of the uh, uh, more ritualistic aspects of, of some of the things on the Christian calendar. And... Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. But in a lot of churches, I mean, people will be passing out palm branches and, and they'll be waving them and that kind of stuff and, and recognizing the triumphal entry of Jesus into uh, Jerusalem before his crucifixion. And, and, and I think that's fine. But let me tell you something. If you're going to wave a palm branch on Monday, I mean, excuse me, on Sunday saying Hosanna uh, to the king, make sure that you're also giving that same recognition to the king on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, don't just do it on one special day. Amen? Uh, but uh, anyhow, uh, uh, you say, well, why don't we ever do that? Well, I've just never felt impressed to do so. And if I ever do, I promise you, uh, some of y'all that got access to palm branches, I'll be talking to you. Uh, but, uh, you know, at any rate, some will do that. That's okay. Uh, because we need to have our focus on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we need to remember what Jesus has done for us. And, and, and yet, as I began to think about this, and I saw this passage, it says, God that cannot lie 
promised before the world began. You know, and I got to thinking about these promises. And by the way, promises are are really between us and God. It's a two-way street. God makes promises to us. But now, let's be honest. A lot of times, we make promises to God as well. Uh, The only difference is, we sometimes don't do such a good job about keeping our promises, do we? You ever uh, have this with with a child? Uh, those of you that have raised children or are in the process right now of raising children, you have this kind of a conversation. They get into trouble about something, and you're getting ready to, uh, uh, you know, dis- uh, you know, give out dispense whatever kind of punishment they're going to receive, and oh, they're pleading with you to be lenient, and they'll say, "Oh, mom, oh, dad, I promise I won't ever do that again." You ever hear that from one of your youngins? And 30 minutes later, they're doing the exact same thing again. And you're saying, what? What is wrong with you? Did I bump it? I promise I won't do it again. I promise I won't do it again. And, and you know really what they're trying to do? They're trying to get out of trouble. Amen? I mean, let, I mean let, let's just face it. But the funny thing is, all of us have a tendency of doing the same thing with God. And so, I just want to focus today on on some of the empty promises. And and I'm not going to give a specific, oh, I promise I'm going to do this, this, and this. But I'm going to make it general enough that every one of us, we can plug in whatever it is that sometimes we we have a routine of of trying to make bargains with God. Say, God, if if you'll do this for me, I promise you I will do this and I'll serve you and I'll live for you and I'll... I'll tithe, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, you know, I'll be faithful, ever service, and, and we make all these kind of promises. And, and, you know, God is God, and He understands that we're flesh, and sometimes we mess up, and He loves us anyhow. Amen? Amen? But still, if we're making promises to God, we ought to do it with the attitude and the, and the concept that, that God expects us to keep our word. We expect God to keep His Word to us, therefore we should keep our our Word to God. So let me give you several things here that I think maybe will uh, help you understand where where my mind has been hopefully led by the Spirit of God. First of all, our empty promises to God are often easy promises. You know, sometimes God lays it out and makes it very, very easy. First thing I thought of, and I can't find a, a particular verse to show a discourse between God and man that there was any kind of a a promise that was made on the part of man. But I just imagine uh, that, that there probably was. And I'm taking a little bit of liberty with this. But think about it. When God created man, placed him there in the Garden of Eden, He had everything at his disposal. Everything was wonderful. Everything was perfect. I mean, he could survive strictly by going and and picking a, a piece of fruit off of a tree and eating it. And it had every bit of nourishment that he needed. I mean, he didn't have to worry about going out and, 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 and catching something and then cooking it and all that preparation work and everything else. Man, just take it off the tree, eat it, enjoy it. You're perfectly healthy. You're totally satisfied. And, and all God did. Now, sometimes people say, well, why did God do it this way? One of these days, you're going to have to ask God yourself. Because I can't give you a full-scale answer except for this. I believe God wants people to serve Him because they choose to, not because they have no other option. God made one tree and put it in the garden. And God said, the only thing I require is don't eat from that one tree. I don't know how many other trees there were. In my own imagination, I believe there were probably thousands of other good trees. But there was just one that God said, leave that one alone. Now, we don't know that it happened like this because the Bible doesn't tell us. But can you imagine when God told Adam that? Just leave that one tree alone, Adam. Do you understand? I could see Adam saying, yes, God, I promise I won't do it. I'll leave it alone. I'll never go and eat from that one tree. You've given me all these other trees. Everything I've got is provided. Why in the world would I want to go and eat from that one tree? And yet, God made Eve 
And the serpent came and tempted, and the very thing that God told them not to do, they both ended up doing. Eating from that one tree. I don't know what there is about us as human beings, but we always want to do exactly what we're told not to do. You ever notice that? You say, oh, not me. I'm always perfect. You're lying, too. Okay? I don't know about you, but if somebody says, do not enter, I want to enter. You know? Now, I, now, fortunately, I, I, I had this thought go through my mind last night, and, it, 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 and still, to this day, it boggles me. Back in our first church, uh, we had one family that had this little boy, and this little boy, oh, he was a character. I mean, he was a character. And uh, what they would use to discipline him was a fly swatter. Okay? And they'd hit the back of his hand with a fly swatter. Now, don't anybody go call the law. The statute of limitations already passed. It's been too many years ago. But they'd use a fly swatter. Now, frankly, they should have used a two-by-four. But uh, anyhow, but uh, this little guy, he would start walking over, and he'd get ready to touch something, and they'd say, no, no, no. You know what will happen if you touch that. This is the honest truth. He'd walk over to the side of the refrigerator, pick up the fly swatter, take it over, hand it to him, and then walk back over there and touch it anyhow. <laughs> now that's why I say they should have used a two by four. Okay? I mean, buddy, isn't that, you say, yeah, but that's sort of extreme. It might be a little bit extreme, but that is human nature. We're always tempted to do the very thing that we're told we should not do and it's not good for us. I mean, that, that, that's what Satan did. He took that one tree, the only tree in the garden that was forbidden, and tempted them and they fell. You know, one of the things that we need to understand, anybody that tells you uh, that living for Jesus is always easy, they're lying to you. Life is not always easy. But I'm going to tell you something. The yoke of Jesus is a whole lot easier than the yoke of sin. And I got scripture for that. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. What did Jesus say? He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus did not say there would not be a yoke. He didn't say that at all. But he did say my yoke is easy. Compared to what the other yoke would be, the yoke of sin, the burden of sin. I got news for you. I've been around a lot of folks and I thought to myself, you know what? I'm glad I decided not to follow Jesus because what I deal with in life is a whole lot better than what they deal with in life. Even though I have struggles just like everybody else and so do you, the yoke of ease, uh, the yoke of Jesus is easier than the yoke of sin. And when we truly experience God, it makes following Jesus easier. Philippians chapter 3 verse 8. A passage I use often but I love it so much. He said this in verse 8. Yea doubtless and I count all things but loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And do count them but dung that I may win Christ. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law. But that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. That I may know him. And the the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Listen, when we really, 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 truly experience the Lord Jesus Christ, experience God, listen, it makes following Jesus easier because we all of a sudden come to that realization, man, the ultimate goal in my life is to know him. And the power of His resurrection, it becomes real. Listen, I want you to understand something here. This preacher is not trying to peddle to you today just some kind of a religious experience. I want you to have a personal, real, vital relationship with Christ. Amen. And when you know Him, it makes following Jesus an easier prospect. Sometimes our empty promises are easy promises. Sometimes our empty promises to God are even beneficial promises. In other words, if we keep our promises to God, it'll help us. It'll be good for us. And yet sometimes even when they're good for us, 
we don't necessarily do it. Uh, maybe um, I probably told this before, but uh, uh, and and I'm using a lot of uh, of liberty here with this story. Uh, an older couple passed away at the same time. They arrived in heaven. They're being taken around. And, and all of a sudden they, they get brought into this, this palatial place and, and, they're set, and they're told, this is your no, new home. And the old guy says, now wait a minute, how much is this going to cost? He says, now listen, this is heaven. It's all free. It's already paid for by Jesus. Everything's free. And then they take them out and show them a golf course. And it is beautiful. And says, listen, you can play here anytime you want to. And the old guy says, well, how much does this cost? He says, hey, man, listen, it's free. It's, it's all paid for. Just just sign up. I mean, you can, you can enjoy it. Then they, they go in and, and, and they, they're, they're, they're shown a, a huge buffet with some of the most, uh, you know, luxurious food you can imagine. And uh, says, listen, come eat any time you want to. And the old guy once again says, well, now how much is this going to cost? And the guy said, listen, haven't I told you over and over and over? It's all free. And then the man reached up, took his hat off of his head, threw it down on the floor, began to stomp on it. And uh, and he was all upset. And, and, and the angel said, what in the world is wrong with you? And he turned to his wife and he said, listen, if it hadn't have been for your brand muffins, we'd have been here five years ago. <laughs> Amen. Our wives try to feed us a certain way to try to help us. Amen. For our benefit. But listen, many times the promises that we make to God and the promises that God expects of us would benefit us if we would just follow those things. You see, the truth of the matter is obeying God does not deprive us, but allows us to be blessed by God. In the book of Titus, in chapter number uh, 2, Titus chapter 2, verse 12. You know, a lot of times people think, and, and particularly, I hate to say it, but sometimes it's younger people. It's our teenagers, it's our young adults. They say, well, you know, I just don't want to get that committed to following God because I won't be able to do all the things that my friends are doing. Well, you know what? Some of your friends may be messing your life up if you follow them. That's right. And following God may be the best thing you can do. In Titus chapter 2 it says, Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Listen, and when God says, leave those things alone, He's not trying to deprive you. He's not trying to hurt you. He's trying to say, listen, that's the kind of stuff that will hurt you. Leave it alone. If I brought in a great big bowl full of uh, M&M's, I wish M&M's were made in dark chocolate. I would enjoy them a whole lot better. I, I can probably only eat a pound at a time on the regular ones. Uh, but uh, anyhow... Uh, but if I had one, and, and I, then I announced said, okay, anybody wants some M&M's, you can have some. But I want to let you know, tr trust me, there's only one in there that's poison, and it'll kill you if you get that one. But go ahead and help yourself. How many of you are going to come up there and grab a big handful of M&M's and start eating? Yeah. Say, well, most of it's a, you know what, that's the devil, what the devil does. He promises, oh, come on, it won't hurt you. But there's always that one element that will. Be careful. Be careful. Listen, obeying God doesn't deprive us, but allows us to be blessed by God. And in fact, in, in being obedient to God, we become a peculiar treasure to God. I love this in Exodus chapter 19 when the children of Israel were getting ready to receive the law. Notice what happens here in Exodus 19 verse 5. He says, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before uh, uh, and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded them. And all the people answered together and catch this and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. 
And yet before Moses even got off the mount after receiving the tablets of stone, they had made them a golden calf and they were dancing naked around it. Wow. God says, if you obey me, I'll make you a peculiar treasure. I'll make you special. You'll be mine. We'll be in a special relationship with one another. You know what the devil is? The devil is masterful in deceiving and luring us with the thought that we're missing something good. That's what he does. He doesn't come across and say, hey, go ahead and, and enjoy this and you'll end up with cirrhosis of the liver and kidney failure and, and lung cancer. Yeah, go ahead. That's what it's going to do to you. No, he says, oh, come on. Everybody else is doing it and it's fun. It'll make you feel good. Well, the pleasure of sin only lasts for a season. And then you've got to pay the price. You know, God says, keep your promises. They'll be beneficial. And then, our empty promises to God are often convenient promises. Convenient. Convenient from our perspective. You see, what are we prone to do? We're prone to vow to God in times of trouble. Psalm 66, verses 13 and 14. Notice what the psalmist said. I will go into thy house with burnt offerings. I will pay thee my vows, which my lips have uttered and my mouth has spoken when I was in trouble. Now, it's a good thing whenever somebody gets in trouble and they actually keep their, their word. But how many of us, let's, let's just be honest, we faced a real tragedy, we faced a real crisis, and we go to God and say, God, I promise, I promise, you get me out of this, I'll do right. You get me out of this, I'll, I'll never mess up again. I'm not saying that all stories will end like this, but we had a man in our church in Florida. Never forget one, one Sunday night, he came and got on his knees at the altar. And started reaching into his pockets and pulling out bottles full of all kinds of pills. He says, I'm turning them over to God. Turning them over to God. And before we left the church that night, and I know I've been told since then that they tell us not to do this. But we took them into the men's room and flushed them all down the toilet. There were probably hundreds of dollars worth of pills of all kinds that we flushed down the toilet that night. You know what? I got him into a, 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 a facility in Texas and, and he was doing great. They actually wanted to hire him on staff, but his family didn't want to move to Texas, so he came back. He did great for a period of time. But his family never supported him. Not the way they could have. And then... I got the call one day that he was dead. Started using drugs again. Went out of his mind. Flipped out. Sheriff's Department showed up. He had a great big knife and he was coming right at one of the deputies with a great big knife. And the deputy shot him and killed him. You know, that was one of the hardest funerals I ever did. Because I knew at one point when he was keeping his promise to God, as a result of being in trouble, he did well. But as soon as he forgot about his promise, his life spiraled out of control. I mean, sometimes it's convenient. We get in trouble. We go to God and say, God, help me! Help me! And boy, that's a good thing. But then we need to keep up with it. You see, many convenient promises can really quickly become empty promises. I'm not going to take the time to read this entire passage, but you can look it up for yourself. But in 2 Samuel 15, verse 1, we find the story of Absalom. And Absalom, the Bible says, he, he, he gathered together a bunch of chariots and men and, and then would get out there in the gates of the city and his people would come in to offer up their petition for judgment. He'd go out and meet them and says, Oh, if I was the one in charge, I'd take care of you. I'd help you out. I promise you I would do that for you. And the Bible says he stole the hearts of the children of Israel. And then he went to his father, King David, and says, Let me go to Hebron. I need to go back to Hebron because... 
And this is what he said. He may have been just lying through his teeth. We don't know. But he says, I've made a vow unto God. And David said, go. And all Absalom did when he got back to Hebron was gathered his forces together to begin a civil war against his own father. You know, that was a convenient promise. Became an empty promise because he wasn't following the leadership of God. You know, here's, here's what's sad. As human beings, and this may not be a real popular thought, but it's still good for us to think about. Whether we like it or not, too often we may vow and assume that we can use God just like we use other people. Oh, I promise I'll take care of that. And we don't. We look at God and say, God, I promise I'll do this. You say, yeah, but God is God. He knows what we're going to do. That's true. But you know what? God still expects us to keep our word to him. By the way, don't we expect God to keep his word to us? What if God was as faithful to keep his promises to us as we were to keep our promises to him? Well, that's a frightening thought. That's a frightening thought. Let me give you one last thing. Our empty promises are still binding promises. You say, really? Yeah. According to what the Bible says, God expects us to keep our promises to Him. In, in, in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes, in chapter number 5, very familiar passage, it says, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel that it was an error, wherefore God should be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands. That sounds pretty straightforward to me. God expects us to keep our promises. In fact, one of the things that we're going to face when we stand before God and how God is going to do the judgment and everything else, I'll be honest, I don't know. How in the world He's going to judge all, those, uh, all, all the believers at the judgment seat of Christ during the time of the tribulation and get through with all of us in enough time to get back and do everything else? I don't know how God can do that except the fact that I know that God is the master of time. Amen. He'll work it out, however pleases him. But one of the things that we're going to be held accountable for are our words. You say our words? Yeah, our words. Matthew chapter 12, verse 35, it says this. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Sound to me like we need to be a little bit cautious about what we say. We need to be cautious, because we will give an account for our words. And then we need to realize none of us are immune from making empty promises. This is the day we recognize on the Christian calendar. That day when Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. The multitudes took down palm branches and laid them in the way. They would wave those palm branches. They put, uh, the disciples put, put their, their outer garments on the back of that donkey so that he could ride comfortably and ride into the city of Jerusalem. And the multitudes cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna. Well, that, that was astounding. You see, the multitudes, when they saw Jesus rightly, they celebrated his authority. Matthew chapter 21 says this, And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, uh, and put on them their clothes, and they sat him thereon, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed, crying, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of, of Nazareth, of Galilee. 
They were recognizing him for who he really was. They were saying, okay, this is the one. And I'm going to tell you what, if you lift up your voice and say, Hosanna to somebody, you are recognizing them as Lord of Lords, the Messiah. That's what they were saying. I promise. You're the one. You're the Messiah. You're the one. You fulfilled exactly what God said. And yet, in just a matter of hours, you say, well, it could be days. Uh, uh, true. But you add it all up, it's just really a very brief period of time. That's the multitude was then crying something different. They went back on that promise when they cried Hosanna. In Mark chapter 15 and verse 11, it says, But the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him which ye call the king of the Jews? Notice that. He said, ye call him the king of the Jews. When they cried Hosanna, that's, that was really what they were saying. And they cried out again, crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, why, what evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. That's always amazed me. How one day the multitudes are crying out, Hosanna! Hosanna! And just a couple of days later, they're clenching their fists and screaming out, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! Release Barabbas! We would rather have a murderer walking in our midst than this one that calls himself the King of the Wow. That blows my mind. The good news for you and I is we've got a God that keeps His promises to us. We may fail to keep our promises to Him as well as we should, but He keeps His promises to us. I think each and every one of us need to examine our relationship with the Lord Jesus today. You say, well, I, you know, okay, I, I, I promise. I, I, I said yes to Jesus. But do you really have a relationship with him? Or, or is it a head knowledge without a heart reality? We need, to, uh, we need to stop and think. Say, really, have I accepted that promise of salvation that's through the shed blood of Christ? It's not just joining a club. It's not just joining a church. It's just not promising to do better. It's realizing that the Lord of glory shed His blood on a cruel cross. And that's what purchased our salvation. And we're putting our faith and trust in that. Have we really committed our life to faithfully follow Jesus? we got a lot of folks in modern day Christianity that are content to be spectators but not necessarily followers. We need more followers. Are we sensitive to obey God daily in our life? I, I believe this. A life of joy is only found as we enjoy the promises of God and follow in obedience. You really want to have joy? Get on the same page with Jesus. Well, I'm not saying you won't have challenges. You will, but you'll still have joy. You follow the world, the flesh, or the devil, and I guarantee you, oh, you might have some fun along the way, but it's short-lived, and you'll never enjoy joy. You want to have joy? Real joy? Turn to Jesus. Make Jesus Lord in your life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heads bowed eyes closed let God speak to you how many oh I had to stop and take a bit of an inventory and became ashamed of myself how many promises have we made to God 
that turned out to be empty promises because we never kept them. Oh, God help us. The good news is, we can confess those things and He'll forgive us for that. But we need to start off fresh saying, God help me. I want to live for Jesus in such a way that when I keep it, make a promise, I keep it. God help us, let's do that. Do you really know Jesus as your Savior? Is He real in your life? If not, today's a good day to get that settled. Whatever your need is today, turn it over to Jesus. You want joy? Follow Him. You want frustration? Don't follow Him. I'd rather have joy. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for loving us. Pray, Lord, that your will would be done in this invitation time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's what if I could tell you that I could share with you the best news imaginable? I'm sure that'd be a refreshing thought when we consider that normally what we hear on television and the radio today is nothing but bad news. What if I could share with you the fact that we could spend eternity in a perfect place where everything is joyful and there's no more sin or death or suffering. Of course, the Bible tells us that place is called heaven. Now, there are many religions that all have different ways to tell you how they perceive that you could get to heaven. Most religions say, do this, do that, do the other. And if you do enough of the good stuff, then you just might make it. I'm glad that there's a better way than what religion says. The Bible tells us that God loves us. In fact, in John 3, 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, the fact of the matter is we could never do enough on our own to be acceptable to God because we're sinners, we're fallen. And God knows that, and that's why Jesus came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross of Calvary. He shed his blood. But that's not the end of the story. When they put his body in the grave, three days and three nights later, the Bible says that he rose again. He conquered death. And today, he's seated at the right hand of the Father to be our Savior, to be our High Priest, to be the mediator between us and a holy and righteous God. Now for us to have the right relationship with Him, it's not that we have to do things to earn His favor. He's already done all that is necessary. He came, He died, He paid for our sins. The only thing that He requires is that we accept Him as our Savior. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then to be able to accept this great salvation, the Bible says very simply, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Dear friend, Salvation is as simple as us accepting by faith what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary and then calling out by faith to Him and accepting that wonderful gift of salvation. The greatest decision you'll ever make is to trust Christ as Savior. And I'd like to encourage you to trust Christ today as your Savior. And then you can go to Him in prayer and you can pray something like this and say, Dear God, I know I'm a sinner, but I know you died for me on the cross. And right now, right here, I accept you as my Savior. Please save me, and I thank you for your promise to do so. And you can pray that in Jesus' name, and you can have the best news ever that you've got a home waiting for you in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you.